in Genesis chapter 3. Praise God. Good to have all of our guests here tonight. Amen. What a wonderful move of God we had Sunday night. I'm telling you, you know, it's not by power nor by might, but how? By my spirit, saith the Lord. There's another one of those third dimension in grace. Not by power nor by might, but by my spirit. We, we got there Sunday night. I pray that all of you did. Because God took us in the Holy of Holies Sunday night. We walked into the throne room, the third dimension of grace. So I noticed, y'all sit down, I'm going to preach. Before I even get in the Word. I know some of y'all kind of standing around, you know, looking around, wondering what, well, what's next. I'm telling you something. God took us in. Whenever we have a move of God like that, just go with the flow of the Spirit. See, that's our problem. We get so caught up in our traditional settings and structures, the way we always do things, right? We, do, we sing songs, and then we do this, and then we do that. And a lot of times we miss God completely because we want to do it this way. But when God starts moving like He did Sunday night, well, we just need to flow with the Spirit of God, and He's going to take us into the third dimension. He's going to take us right in the Holy of Holies. And He did, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit. You understand that, right? That concept? Okay, let's just see how the Lord's going to lead us tonight. I prepared, but uh, I'm trusting Him just to have His way. Um, before we look at chapter 3, I would like for you to please look at chapter 2, verse 3, please, first. <clears throat> and I believe by the time we get through chapter 3, we'll come back around to this truth in God's Word, okay? Y'all with me tonight? It's good to see the house of the Lord. Or really, we are His house, but anyway, this place filled with people hungry for the Word of God. Verse 3, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it He had rested, say rested, rested. say rested, rested, from all His works, from all His work, which God created and made. Chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. He said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Say, with her. And he did eat, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 <clears throat> in the New Testament. Quickly, very quickly, please. Hebrews chapter 4. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 1 Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Of what? <clears throat> the rest of God. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. He finished all His works from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> and then what does it say? That He rested, right? In chapter 2 and verse 3, on the seventh day, He rested. So there's a rest that we can enter into. Is that correct? Verse 4, For He spake in a certain place of the seventh day 
on this wise. Y'all still with me in this? And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if you shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore, notice it doesn't say enter into my day. It says enter into my rest. Everybody still here? All right. <clears throat> Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited, limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, say today. today. After so long a time, as it is said, Today, say today. today. If you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. So when is the rest available? Today. today. There remaineth, there, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works. As God did from his. That means you stop doing your thing and you start doing God's thing. <clears throat> That's what happened Sunday night. We stopped doing our thing and we did his thing. And He took us right into that dimension in the Spirit. And there was powerful things that took place. Powerful strongholds were broken. Powerful deliverance. Powerful re reconciliation. So you cease from your own works and you start doing His works. But you've got to see His works. You've got to find out what His works are. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. It's not a day. It's a rest. Do you understand that? Okay. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing the center of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Why would God put that verse right there in the middle of a chapter where He's talking about rest? He's talking about a sword. Say a sword. God's good. Why would He put this here? Let me read this verse again to you. For the Word of God is quick. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Verse 11. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper then any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing center of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. <clears throat> you know why he put it there? Because he's got to take his sword, he's got to take his word, and he's got to cut your head off. You know what that means? You've got to stop thinking your thoughts. You've got to start thinking his thoughts. His word is quick, it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And you watch what happens before this service is over. God's sword, God's word is going to come in this place. He's going to divide between the soul and the spirit. He is a discerner. He's a critic of the thoughts and the intents of your heart tonight. He knows every thought you have. He knows every word you said. He knows everything about you tonight. And He's going to cut your thinking out of you and replace your thinking with his thinking. You got to start thinking like God thinks. So there's going to be major surgery that takes place in order for that to happen. Okay, so going back to Genesis 2 then, and in verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now uh, go to Mark 2. Let's look at this. Mark 2. Got to get the reading here taken care of. Verse 23, And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day. When was the Sabbath day? The seventh day, right? That's a Saturday. It's a literal day, right? And his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, 
Behold, why do they on this Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have you never read what David did when he had need and was a hungered? He and they that were with him. How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest, and gave also to them which were with him. He said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is the Lord also of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was not a Jewish thing. The Sabbath was given by God before man ever even fell. The Sabbath was given by God about 2,000 years before there ever was a Hebrew named Abraham. The Sabbath day was given approximately 2,500 years before the law was ever instituted. And it became a day, the seventh day at that time, and they observed it under the law. Do you understand? So what I'm trying to show you is that the Sabbath is the rest of God. It is, listen, the day passed through the cross. You understand? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to just take my time. And uh, if you want me to run and put on a show, you'll have to wait till the end of the service. All right, y'all with me? Who was the Sabbath day for? The Sabbath day was for man. Not for the Jews. <clears throat> It was for all men at all time because it's the rest of God. It's not just for the earth. It's for the heavens. It's not just for us now. It's for us there. It's this seventh day here pictures the kingdom age. We have just started the seventh millennium. It's not just another millennium. It's the seventh millennium. And we just entered into that seventh millennium. This passage is pointing to the seventh millennium. But I didn't have to wait till the seventh millennium to experience the rest of God because the rest of God is eternal. And when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, I got filled with the rest of God. And the day, the se seventh day, a Saturday, it passed, P-A-S-T, passed through the cross. It passed, P-A-S-S-E-D, through the cross. It was nailed to the cross. The day was nailed to the cross. But the rest is eternal because it's in God and it wasn't just for the Jews it was for all men Jesus said uh, the Sabbath was not made or man was not made for the Sabbath the Sabbath was made for what? for man do you understand this? so we're talking about the rest of God and they got it on a certain day the seventh day and they observed it but you can have a day and still not have the rest I ask you a question. If the rest of God is for heaven, earth, and the heavens, you think when you get in heaven that God's going to have us on a weekly, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday calendar? What I'm trying to show you is the rest of God was before the fall of man. It was in God in eternity. And the day they observed in the... Old Testament, the Old Dispensation, the Old Bible. Listen to me. It passed through and passed, P-A-S-T, through the cross and passed through the cross. And now we have the reality of the type. Come on. 
So I'm not laboring to enter into a day. I'm laboring into a rest. Okay. Y'all don't mind me doing this, do you? How many days from Adam to Christ? Thousand year days. Four thousand years, right? One, two, three, four. And then we had the Lord Jesus, right? Okay. When He came, started the fifth day, sixth day, seventh day, right? Where are we right now? That's what's so awesome about this millennium that we're entering into. We're in the seventh millennium right now. From Adam. Do you understand? All right. When the Lord came, died on the cross, then we started the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh day. So that's the first day, second day, or I'm sorry, first, second, third dimension in grace. You with me? You got to see. I, we're gonna keep going over this. The seventh day is the third dimension in grace, and that's where we are right now. We're not only in it spiritually, we are in it literally. What is God about to do? So look. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The way, the truth, the life. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. And that was the word of God in this house. Sunday night. The eve of the new year, that was the word of the Lord in this house. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. And God took us in the spirit into the seventh day and third dimension of grace. That is why for me to have come up here after God moved and opened my Bible and preached like I, and I was ready and I have an awesome message I'm going to preach to you. I wanted to preach. But for me to have done that, we would have missed God. And I'm trying to help us understand, we've got to get sensitive to the Holy Ghost. We can't stand around and wait and do our own things. We've got to find out what God's doing in the heavens. Say the rest of God. In fact, when we come to Noah, you know what? Noah's name means rest. So it's not a day. It's an experience in the Holy Ghost that can be experienced in any time in history. Y'all with me? Y'all remember that, right? So after Sunday night, I got out of there, out of church. I said, Lord, quicken to me. He said, that's, that's the third dimension right there. Not by power, nor by my, but by my spirit. I'm going to tell you something. If we can just see what God is doing and stop looking at what we're supposed, we think we're supposed to be doing. And we can cease from our own labors and look in the Spirit, see in the Spirit what God is doing and say, God, let it happen in this earth. I'm going to tell you something. We're getting ready for some awesome things. Could be that we're about to enter into glory. It could be that we're about to be raptured. And I'll explain that to you. That's what I was going to preach on Sunday night. But I'll explain to you that very early on the third day, throughout the Scripture on the third day, God comes down and the people go, Whoa! But right now in the Holy Ghost, we're moving in the Spirit, man. We're moving into the rest of God. We're moving into some awesome dimensions in the Holy Ghost. We're, we're moving it. Look, come on. Listen. Okay, i got to do this. Again. Here's the tabernacle in the Old Testament, right? Outer enclosure, right? Tabernacle. Holy place, holy of holies. Are y'all still here? Watch. Um, I, I can't believe I'm preaching this tonight. I'm supposed to be preaching Genesis, but I, maybe I am. 
Where does the light shine from? It shines from eternity. Back on the cross, the work of Christ, and that shadow is this right here. So that the seventh day, the day is a shadow. The tabernacle is a shadow. You understand? Okay. Whenever this shadow, okay, a light hits it from eternity. What, what is a shadow? It's, it's a light hitting an object. It's an object standing in light. Come on, this is not that complicated. And when it hits it, it reflects it back over here. But listen, as you're walking through the types and the shadows in the Old Testament, come on, you with me? They killed a sacrifice, they walked through a shadow. They killed another sacrifice, they walked through a shadow. And all the way through the Old Testament, they're walking through shadows, moving towards the reality. This is the reality. Jesus Christ and Him crucified is the reality of the types and the shadows. So they kept moving through types and shadows. Closer and closer. Here comes Jesus. He's born. With me? And He passed, the shadow passed through the cross and became a reality. So that now the shadow comes up and lays on the other side. Because it's done. So we have the tabernacle being laid out like this, right? Come on. Tabernacle. You wonder why I'm doing this. By the time I get to the end of Genesis, you're going to see. You'll understand. I know that's not a pretty drawing, but anyway. So look. First dimension, outer enclosure. Second dimension, holy place. Third dimension, the throne room. The kingdom. And it falls on the third dimension in grace and the seventh day, the fifth day, sixth day, and seventh day. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Because remember we had one, two, three, four back here from Adam to Christ and then three more days, seven. So five, six, and seven we have it laid over on this because this is fulfilled now. And this would be the fifth day, sixth day, seventh day. Also first dimension, second dimension, and third dimension. So when we talk about not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, that means, come on, out here, it's man working. In here, it's man with God. Remember, they had to trim the lamps. They had to renew the showbread. Everybody still with me? So they were working, they were laboring with God. But when you get in here, it's all God. And that's what he's talking about that we need to enter into is the rest of God. Where it's all God. Where we've ceased from our own labors. And we see what he's already done from the foundation of the world. And we say, let it be done in the earth. So God gave us the word Sunday night, not by power. Nor by might, but by my spirit. It's being kingdom minded. Okay, y'all with me? All right, now look. The enemy's going to come in there. He's going to disrupt the whole thing. The enemy is a Sabbath breaker. And so are all those who follow him. They are Sabbath breakers. Not day. The rest of God. Does this make sense to you? What is the rest of God? When you see God, it's all God. And you just do what He's already told you. What's already done in the heavens. Thy will be done on earth as it is in the in heaven. Okay, y'all, y'all with me in this? See, God is laying patterns. But now we got this enemy coming there, this Sabbath breaker. He's going to disrupt the whole thing. 
He's a murderer from the beginning. He's going to kill Adam and Eve. Yes, they sinned. And they didn't have to. But he was a murderer from the beginning. And he's going to come and he's going to sow temptation and they're going to bite and they're going to take it and they're going to die. And they're going to lose the rest of God. You understand? Okay. So let's look at this. Verse 1, chapter 3. Do you understand? Do you understand the Sabbath is for everybody? The, the day has been nailed to the cross. But the Sabbath is eternal. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now this is, we're picking up where we left off last week. But here comes the serpent. I wonder what he looked like. I wonder why this woman would even listen to this serpent. Why doesn't, first of all, let me tell you, first thing we get in trouble with is when we start listening to him when he talks to us. Listen, he starts coming around you, don't even strike up a conversation with him. Don't even talk to him. Mistake one she made when he came to talk to her, she talked back. And listen to him. She said, said, get out of the garden. Do you understand? So here comes this serpent. I wonder, the Bible says that she was deceived. Adam wasn't deceived, but she was deceived. Right? How, did we fall in her or did we fall in Adam? We fell in Adam, right? He's the federal head. We didn't fall in her. We fell in him. We were recovered in her. Because Timothy said that you'd be saved, they would, women would be saved through childbearing. Which means she gave birth to the Savior of the world. So we didn't fall in her. We were recovered through the woman. Thank God for the women. And that's what this chapter is going to talk about. The seed of the woman. And this. So she was deceived. She sinned when she took that fruit. She disobeyed God. She acted independently of God. And she sinned. But she didn't sin like Adam sinned. Adam, when he sinned, he knew exactly what he was doing. He deliberately sinned. She was deceived. I'll give you an example. She kind of wandered into the enemy's camp and was captured. It's one thing to wander into the enemy's camp and be captured. It's altogether different when you know what you're doing and you lead a whole group of people into the enemy's camp and you're thereby captured. That's what happened. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. He's leading a whole family into captivity where she was just a wandering person, so to speak, and she was captured that way. So she was deceived. And I wonder what about this serpent caused her to listen to him. Could it be that she thought it was God? Could it be that she thought that this serpent was from the Lord? How many care? Listen, this serpent starts talking to her. She's never heard another animal talk like that. Men have the capability of talking. They're like their creator. Right? But now, she hears a serpent talking. We hear a Balaam's donkey talking. So it's a rare thing to hear an animal talk. So as this serpent's talking... She may have. I'm trying to show you something here because she was deceived. She may have thought that it was from God. What do you think that serpent looked like as he came in the garden? How does he come today? What is his ch uh, chief tool? Drugs? Drugs? Alcohol? 
No, that's not the chief tool of the enemy. It's always religion. Yea, hath God said. See, he's, it's a religious thing. Because if you're a drug addict tonight, he knows that you'll someday along the road say, I need help. And you might get saved. But if he can put you on a church pew somewhere, thinking that you're ready to meet God, thinking you're saved, and you're not saved, but if he can get you to thinking you are, then you will, he will win. He will win. But if he can make a drug addict out of you, he knows there's a possibility of losing you down the road. So he comes to her in a very subtle way. In a form that she is accustomed to. And he's talking to her. Say signs. Miracles. And wonders. Lying signs. Miracles. And wonders. Did he walk? Into the garden? Could he walk? It's possible he walked. We don't know for sure, but it's possible he walked. Because part of the curse was he's going to have to slither on the ground, right? We'll get to that. So how did he travel before he slithered on the ground? Could have walked, but I want to tell you what I really believe. More than just walking, I believe that he flew into that place. Let me show you. Go to Isaiah 14. Verse 29, Rejoice not thou, O uh, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice. I'm on, I'll tell you, I've been standing in this pulpit for seven years telling you I'm going to preach you the cockatrice, and I've never preached it, but I'm going to preach it to you someday. And you might not want to come to church when I do. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery, flying serpent. So the Bible, at least in a couple of places in the Word, tells me that serpents were like fiery, flying serpents. When you see pictures of dragons, got wings on them. So here comes this serpent. Beautiful, shining, majestic serpent comes flying into that garden and begins to speak to her and she gets caught up in it what is his credentials he's able to speak that's a miracle that's a sign that's a wonder now go to second this one's chapter two you want to know how he's working in these last days he's doing the same thing Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Where it talks about the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. All right. Verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. That you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Say, the man of sin is the son of perdition. Bible says who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God remember you not that when I was yet with you I told you these things and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way 
Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. That is what he deceived Eve with, and that's what he's going to deceive the world in the last days. With lying signs and wonders. So that people think because they experience some type of miracle, they're ready to meet God. And because somebody can work a miracle in the pulpit, means they're called of God. That's not the truth. Lying signs and wonders. And that's what God heard then. And that's what's going to get people in these last days. Okay, we went through and we explained the sin that was committed, right? Verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So we see the tempter, we see the temptation here, and then we see those that are being tempted. The woman is tempted. And if you look at it, the Bible says that Adam is with her. You might have this idea that she's standing over by the tree all by herself. But the Bible says Adam is with her. So she's striking up this conversation with the, with the serpent. She reaches up there. She takes the forbidden fruit. As I told you, it didn't matter if it was, if God said don't walk up a mountain, whatever. If God said don't do it, you don't do it. See, some people say, well, I don't think it's all that bad. I don't think it's wrong. It's so beautiful. We went through these things. But if God forbid it, doesn't matter what you think. It's wrong. So she took the fruit. She would just see, take it. And then she gave it to her husband with her. So he's at fault. He should have warned her. He said, don't do that, Eve. He should have drove that devil out of that garden. You know what God said? If we eat this fruit, we will surely die she kind of changed it up. She said, lest we die. No, God said, you will surely die. You understand? See, most people don't believe there's a hell. Because I guarantee you, if people out there walk in the streets and people sitting on these pews tonight really believe there was a hell, they would do something about their soul. But they don't really believe there's going to be a judgment they don't really believe that there's going to be a hell. God said, you're, sh you're going to die. Surely that's what Adam should have told his wife. Right? But he didn't do it. He let her take it, let her eat it. And she gave it to her husband. Right? He didn't have to take it. Why did he take it? Because he loved her more than he loved God. He loved her more than he loved truth. So he took it. What would have happened to Eve if Adam hadn't taken the fruit? God would have destroyed her. She would have died. She would have perished. But Adam would have continued. Do you understand? But he said, no, I love her too much. There's a type of the bride in Jesus Christ, right? He loved us too much. To let us be lost. So the scripture tells us right here. That he eats it. But he does it deliberately. He doesn't wander into the camp and is captured. He deliberately walks into the camp. And sins. Right? And the eyes of them both were open. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together. And made themselves aprons. Oh, man. See, now they know that they did something wrong. Did they get a conscience, a conscience right then? No, they already had a conscience. But the conscience awoke. Where are we tonight? Hallelujah. Everybody here? That conscience awoke. As soon as she took the fruit, she knew she did wrong. As soon as he took the fruit, he knew he did wrong. So he, they go and hide from God. 
They knew there was a conscience. There was something that was already there and it woke up. The little thing inside of you, that little voice that tells you, no, this is wrong. This is right. This is wrong. I want to tell you something. Everybody that stands before God someday and is judged by God will not be able to lift a voice to God and say that's not right because their conscience would have already told them what they had done was wrong. When they stand before God, they'll, have, they'll know. They're, they already know they did wrong. They know they sinned. They know they disobeyed God. So they're not going to challenge God. There's some people in here right now, your conscience is bothering you big time. So that if you were to stand before God in judgment, you couldn't say nothing against God. Because your conscience already told you where you've been wrong. Right? Give the Lord a hand clap for praise. So their conscience was bothering them. Why? They took of something God forbid. And they disobeyed God. They became independent, became gods in and of themselves. They don't want authority in their life. They cast off restraint and they're going to do it their way. They're the center of the universe. That's man's problem. That's my problem. Everybody thinks we're the center of the universe. Everything revolves around us. We're our own gods. And we don't want God telling us any otherwise. You hear? Okay. If you look at this, he was a thief. I don't have time to get into all the typology. You study it for yourself. There's two trees. There's one in the garden. You notice the Bible talks about Jesus' death on the cross. The cross being a tree. Why did God call the cross a tree? He's trying to get you to go back to the beginning. He's trying to show you the trees in the garden. There was a tree in the garden in the beginning. There was a tree that he was crucified. Listen. The tree was in a garden in the beginning. The Bible says Jesus was crucified on a tree in a garden. Look, a thief went up to a tree he was told not to partake of. He ate of a fruit uh, that God said no to. And stand, listen to me. And there was a tree in the midst of two thieves. Jesus Christ hanging between two thieves. And it goes on and on and on like that. You follow it through the Word of God. The Bible says, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Look at people that are hung on a tree in the Old Testament. It's a picture and a type of Jesus hanging on the cross and becoming a curse for us. Look, come on, everybody here. The Bible said one day, God came walking up to Abraham with two other, what, angels, right? I'm going to bust through all this. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to have a move of God in my life tonight. But the Bible says God in theophany form comes up there. Visible manifestation of God with two angels, right? And Abraham sitting over in his tent. Read somewhere in Genesis 18, all right? Bible says, Abraham says, come on. And let's rest. Let's rest under this tree. What was lost in the garden? The rest of God that was lost in the garden. It's all seen in a picture. Abraham said, come rest under this tree. And then as they were resting... He said, Listen, we're going to have a dinner here. We're going to have a communion meal. That's what we did Sunday night. We have the rest of God in us. And we took a communion meal, a fellowship meal with God. So it's all laid out. Say rest. So what was lost here was regained through Jesus Christ. Everybody still here? Okay. And the eyes of them both were open. They knew that they were naked. They sewed big leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. I love that principle. Come on. The Word of God, the voice of God is the manifest token of His presence. I'm telling you, if you want to know God, you've got to hear what I'm preaching tonight. Because I'm preaching the manifest token of His presence. That's His voice. That's His Word. If you won't hear this, you won't hear anything. 
the voice of the Lord God is walking in the garden. What for? He wants to fellowship with them. He wants a relationship with them. He wants a relationship with us tonight. He don't want us to just be religious and going through forms and ceremonies. Come on. He wants us to enter into a rest and a relationship with Him. That's why I told you He had His way Sunday night. It was awesome. He's looking for them. The Bible said they hide from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. Why are they hiding? Because their conscience is bothering them. I want to tell you something. If you ever see somebody stop going to church once they've been coming to church, you ever see them stop, I'll tell you what got a hold of them. They don't want to hear the Word of God preached. They know when when they come to church, they're going to hear the Word of God, and the Word of God's going to convict them of their life. Listen to me. Our lives will keep us from the Word of God. Or the Word of God will keep us away from sin. If you're in sin, you don't want to go to church. Because you've got the spirit of your daddy. You've got the spirit of Adam. You want to run from the presence of God. You don't want to hear Him talking to you like He did before. Because something's not right in your life. I'm going to tell you something. People start missing church and I don't hear from them. I don't know where they are. I don't know what's happened to them. I'll tell you what the problem is. They've got sin in their life. It's keeping them away from God. There are some people who have things come up. But those people who have legitimate things come up, always contact me. But if it's not legitimate, whoa, I don't want to call the pastor. Because I know what I'll... Come on, are you with me? I know what I'll hear from the pastor if I call him. So you run from that word because that word convicts your life. Because you've got the spirit of your daddy Adam. We all do. we got the spirit of our father Jesus. We've got a fallen nature. If something's not right in our life, we all... I see a God that's in love with them. I see a God who's trying to mend the breach in the marital bed. I, I see a God trying, where are they, Adam? I don't see a vindictive God. I see a God who has to vindicate His holiness. Look, listen. Here's what He says. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Why are you hiding from me? Why are you running from me? He hid among the trees of the garden. Hiding in a little bush somewhere. You can't hide from God in a little bush. If you man up with wings as the eagle, God's there. If you go down into hell, God's there. You can't get away from God. But they're running from God. They're afraid. They think they can hide from God. Can't hide from God. He knows right where we are. You understand? Where art thou? <sighs> well, hallelujah. See, when I have a nice little Bible study, at least y'all are. Y'all are having a nice little Bible study. I'm up here preaching my guts out. Well, that's all right. Y'all go ahead and have your nice little Bible study. I don't mind. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to ask you a question. Where are we tonight? Where, where's your longitude and your latitude tonight in God? Do we have a closer walk with the Lord today? Or have we gone away from God a little bit this past year? Are we closer to the Lord now than I was last year? Or am I further away from God now than I was last year? Where are you? I love you. God says, I love you. Where are you? You need to ask that question to yourself today. 
and every day of your life. Where am I today? Am I closer to God today than I was yesterday? Am I closer to God today, this year, than I was last year? Amen. Why is he asking that question? Because of his love. And number two, because of his holiness. Because sin has entered into his dominion. And he's got to take care of it one way or the other. Are you with me? He can't just sweep it under the rug. See, a lot of us, we, we sin, we just want to sweep it under the rug. We don't want to deal with the issue. But God always comes to you and says, Where are you? I love you. My holiness will not allow sin in your life. My holiness will not allow sin to continue. His love demands he ask that question. His holiness demands that he ask that question. He desires to fellowship with you. Don't run from him tonight. You got sin. You got sin in your life. The only way you're going to be saved is to run to him, not run away from him. And, and so look at what Adam says in verse 10. He said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told thee that thou was naked? Oh, look at this awesome loving God. He could have walked up there and just smashed him. Sent him flying into hell. But he says, where are you? Who told you that you were naked? He's given them the ability and the opportunity to repent of their sin. He gives us, all of us, the same opportunity tonight. Where are you? Where's your husbands at? Where's your wives at tonight? Who told you you were naked? He already knows why they're naked. He already knows what has happened. He already knows they sinned. But he wants to give them an opportunity to say, Lord, we sin against you. Don't run from God. He wants you to come and say, Lord, I've sinned against you. He's not a vindictive God. He's a very loving God, but he's a holy God. And you've got to take care of this sin in your life. If you don't take care of it, when he comes to you as a loving Compassionate, merciful, pleading God. You will die and drop into a devil's hell without Him. And it's not because He wanted you to go there. You went there walking over all His grace, all His love, and all of His mercy. If you go to hell, friend, you had to fight pretty hard to get there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Listen, I'm not going to wake up by accident in hell. I'm not, especially as a child of God. Man, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to really do some heavy stuff. I'm gonna have to walk over the love of God, the grace of God, the Spirit of God, talking to me constantly. People praying for me. I'm gonna have to do a lot to go to hell. I know that goes against some of your theology. I'm gonna tell you something. God will plead with you. He will work with you. I looked in the eyes of a man Sunday night. Who I knew that he came in the presence of God. But I looked into hot, very hollow eyes. A very empty person. Because I knew there was something not right in that individual. And he looked back at me. And I could tell there was still something wrong in that person. Even though they had come in the presence of God. But God, see, he keeps wooing. He keeps drawing. He keeps saying, I love you. Let's, let's get this taken care of. Come on. Fix the car. Fix the car and drive on. Repent and keep going. Go get a, out of the broken down car and kick the tires. Get a hammer out of the hood. Fix the car and drive. You got sin in your life? Fix it. Repent. Put it under the blood and keep going. Verse 12, the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree I did eat. So we talked about the woman that he was tremendously in love with. 
So much so that he's willing to disobey God deliberately. Now he loses the capacity to love her. Because anything that becomes, comes between you and your God, you will despise and you will hate it. You will lose your capacity to love anything or any person who comes between you and God. I know what I'm talking about. I've seen people that got, got the Holy Ghost, got baptized in Jesus' name. But because one of the spouses didn't want to live for God, that other spouse said, I'll go with them. You know what? They, they ended up in a divorce. You better not ever listen to the devil come and get you to compromise and say, i got to lay down my faith if I'm going to keep my marriage together. I'm going to tell you what's happening. If you give up your God, you're going to lose God and your marriage. Because you will despise anybody or anything that comes between that relationship. You will completely lose the capacity to love them. I, I want to give you something upbeat here, but I want to tell you, you know who the most miserable people are in the world? People who once had a walk with God, who don't have a walk with God anymore. They're miserable. You get around them, they'll put a big old smile on their face like everything's okay. But they're miserable because they've lost a relationship with God. They hate themselves. They hate the world. They hate everybody. They hate their jobs. They hate everything because God isn't in the equation anymore. Some of you may be sitting here tonight. You got a good job. You got a good relationship. You got a lot of money, etc. Whatever. And you're miserable as you can be because you don't know Jesus Christ. He's not in your life. You understand? Give God praise. It's a sad situation to be in. Well, you've replaced God with something or some person or something or some philosophy, some idea. And you come in a church. You don't have to backslide and go in the world to backslide. You can backslide sitting on a church pew. Because I want to tell you something. You'll never hear somebody that's backslidden worship God out loud. You'll never see them praise the Lord. You'll never see them shout God the, the praises of God. You'll never hear them. You won't hear from them. There's no real depth to their life. There's no real depth to their walk. When they stand up in praise, it's shallow praise because there is no relationship. There is no prayer going on. I want to tell you how high our prayer, our, our worship goes if we're not praying about that high. And that's it. If you don't have a relationship with God, when you come in this house and you start trying to praise, it's empty, it's shallow. Let the high praises of God be in your lips. I, I know what I'm talking about, man. And it's a, it, it, there's spiritual warfare to try to keep us from prayer. But I'm going to announce it again. We're going to be praying in the mornings. And that goes for me and you. We're going to pray in the mornings. We've got to get a relationship with the Lord. He wants to talk to us. He wants to hear from you. We've got to be able to lose our mind and get His. Jesus. Notice what He says. So now He's going to blame the woman, right? So to speak. But really, He's telling the truth. She did give Him that fruit. He's really telling the truth. Whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of this tree. I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? He knows what she's done. Oh, if we could ever get an a, a, a understanding of how good God is, how wonderful He is, how gracious He is, how kind He is, how compassionate He is, how far He will go to have a relationship with you. He'll go so far, He'll leave glory coming in human flesh, coming dust. And die for us on the cross. That's how much He cares for us. And He wants to bless us. Notice. Okay.
gave. And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me. And I did eat. Oh, I, got, I got deceived. I saw him fly in. He was so pretty, so shiny. And he was talk, talking. And there were supernatural signs and wonders. And I just got caught up. And I was deceived. But Adam deliberately, he knew what was going on. You, what, you understand what I'm saying? He could see through what was happening. Right, okay, let's go on. The Bible said this. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. He doesn't even ask the devil any questions. He just judges him. Because the devil has no possibility of redemption. But because man and woman had a possibility of redemption, he's asking them questions so they'll confess their sin, so they can get a relationship together, so the breach can be mended. I hope you see this. His love for Adam says, I want this relationship. But his holiness says, I hate sin. But he judged the serpent. He said, you're going to what? Slide on your belly? Upon thy belly shalt thou go, dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. You know a serpent really does that? A snake does that? He slides on his belly. He'll get up. Let's take an example of rabbit. That rabbit, he'll roll it in the dirt. And then he'll swallow it whole. And he literally eats dust. It's the fulfillment of the Word of God. Are you here tonight? He had no possibility of salvation. I'm not just talking about a snake altogether here. I'm talking about the devil that spoke through him. You understand? So verse 15. Now here comes God. Here's His grace again. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Ah, who's he talking to? The serpent. That say the seed of the serpent. I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. So there is a seed of the woman and there's a seed of the serpent. For all you who are going to sleep on me. Uh, some of y'all got headaches, you're sick. Do you understand that tonight? There is a seed of the serpent in the world today and there's a seed of God in the world today. When we get to Genesis 6, you're really going to understand that. And God said, I will put in between, between thy seed and her seed. Who is He talking about? We have the believers and the unbelievers. We have Jesus Christ, her seed. Antichrist, his seed. Israel, seed of the woman, seed of God. With me? The church is a seed of God. Notice what he says. There's going to be enmity there. How many of y'all know that's true? You're a believer, but you're around an unbeliever. You think it's going to go real good? You think it's going to, everything's going to be hunky-dory? Can two walk together except they be agreed? No! There's going to be enmity. There's going to be war. There's going to be strife. There's going to be obstacles. There's going to be opposition to try to keep you from serving God. But this is beautiful because the Lord says this. It shall bruise thy head. Who? The seed of the woman. The virgin born son of God. He is going to bruise thy head. And thou shalt bruise his heel. So while Jesus is hanging on a cross, he's there suffering and dying in pain for you and for me. He says, I love you, so I'll die for you. But my holiness has to pay a price for the sin. I can't sweep it under the rug. 
So he makes a decree. I've already told you the decrees of God. Number one, he would create the world. Number two, he would decree to put man in that world. With me? Number three, he decreed to permit, permit sin to come. He decreed it. Before he ever made Adam, he made these decrees. And number four, the fourth decree, I will destroy sin myself. And the fifth decree is that all who believe the gospel will be saved. And the sixth decree, all who do not believe will be judged. These are the decrees of God that were laid down in eternity. So there he's hanging on the cross because he loved us and because he hated sin. And he dies for you and for me. And he crushes I got a I got a vision in the spirit when I when I read that it was said I saw the Lord Jesus crushing the head of the serpent, Chateau pushing him pushing him down on the cross while he hung there, his feet nailed and bruised, but crushing the head of the devil. The devil's defeated tonight. He's not a winner. He's a loser. I saw the serpent, that old snake, under the feet of my Lord, wiggling and turning and twisting. And Jesus was there upon his head. Where his venom is in the sack of his head. Where the venom is, he stood there and destroyed him. And then he came walking out of the tomb on the third day. And said, I got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. The devil doesn't even have the keys to his own house. Jesus Christ has got the keys to the devil's house. Hallelujah, Jesus. He said, I love man too much, but I hate sin too much. So I will decree, I'm going to destroy it by sin. He said unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee. Come on. I'm going to give you a promise. I'm going to take care of the sin problem. But here's the consequence of the sin. God will forgive us of our sin, but sometimes there's consequence to our sin. Do you understand that? So in, in, when she gave birth to children... Is going to be in sorrow. How many of y'all ladies have ever had a child before? And you know how painful that is. That's why. It goes back to the garden, right? Terrible thing, right? Notice what else? There's another problem here. She says, he says to her, And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Everybody still here? Okay, I'm almost through. I hope I'm not boring you tonight. Come on, look at verse 7 of chapter 4. Verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. See that? 
What's sin doing? Like, a, like an animal sitting at the door of Cain, ready to pounce on Cain. So go back to chapter 3. And thou desire shall be thy husband to thy husband. So we had this conflict that Paul even talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. That when you get married, don't you know you're going to have trouble in the flesh? Why is there trouble? Because of the fall. The woman, her desire will be to her husband, which means she's going to be like an animal trying to dominate him. The domineering woman. Oh, it's quiet in here. Men walk around like little whipped puppies. Because they got a domineering woman in the house. It's like an ant. Oh, you, come on. I, you go ahead and get quiet. I'm going to hit this. And that woman's like an animal. Hey, you need. Hey, go, go. Came from the garden. But then we have a problem with the man. And he shall rule over you. So you're trying to control him, and he's trying to control you. So you got war in the house. He's trying to be a dictator over you, and you're trying to tell him how to run everything and how to do everything. So we have this conflict constantly. I thank God that He came, Jesus came, to deliver us, to save us. So that we don't have to live under that curse. You women don't have to be domineering and oppressive to your husbands. And you husbands don't have to beat your wives to make them line up. Boy, it's quiet in here now. Oh, oh ladies, what do you want me to do? Tell, uh, tell uh, the men it was all their fault? Men, what do you want me to do? Tell the ladies it was all their fault? Come on, God can give us a better life than that. I mean, I know we haven't arrived at Sister Jolene and Brother Bloss, but, you know, we're really working at it. I've never seen any couple that's, that love each other so much like they love each other. I mean, they look at each other sweet all the time. Just makes me sick, you know. We're trying to catch up. Y'all pray for us. But I'm telling you, man, this war that goes on between the husbands and the wives come from the fall. It's about time that we start doing it God's way instead of doing it the devil's way. See, I love to preach like this because some of y'all, when y'all come to church, are so quiet, so shy. And then we drive by your house and here's pans and rocks and windows and dogs are flying and cats are flying. and Go in the house, there's holes and walls everywhere, man. Busted doors. And y'all are so sweet. You come to church, huh? Praise God. I'm telling you, we needed a Savior. And He came. So if you don't have God in your life, that will be a perpetual thing. Even when you got God in your life, it's still. If it wasn't for God, some of you would be dead. I'm having problems with my family, so I'm going to quit God. You better thank God you have God. Because if you didn't have God, you'd probably be dead or you'd probably be in jail. Don't throw in the towel when you have a problem at home. God is the only thing that can help you. Have you ever noticed before you come to church, that's when you, oh, war, World War Four, man.
Everybody except Brother Blossom and Sister Jolie. You see, they don't even know what I'm talking about. They're pretty close to glorification. Do I have a witness in the house? Have you ever seen them get cross with each other? I have never seen it. Have you ever seen the pastor in his walk? I mean, they're approaching glorification. I prove. But it, this is a problem from the fall. And we need God to help us. And you don't need to stay home from church when you have a fight. You need to get yourself up, go to the house, so you can get full of the Holy Ghost. So you can pray through, so you can get some help. So if I can, we can just make it to the church. I know when we leave... Well, we'll see things differently for at least today. Do you understand these words? Thy desire shall be to thy husband. It doesn't mean she's going to desire the husband. She's going to want to dominate him. He shall rule over her. He's going to want to be a domineering dictator over her. Y'all know that was in the Bible? There's a lot of things in the Bible. If you marry outside of God, you really got a mess on your hands. You better not marry an unbeliever if you're a believer. You got major problems ahead of you. It might look okay right now, but you got major war ahead of you. I, I don't say that vindictively. I say that to warn you. Watch out. You better be praying. Because the devil's going to try to destroy your soul because of that decision. I know what I'm talking about. I've seen too many that once sit on these pews that married an unbeliever. They've gone away from the church. And so as I know, I don't know if they're even living for God. Most of them aren't living for God. I'm telling you what, man. I felt weakness come all over me. Ooh, I feel a spirit coming on somebody right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I come against that spirit in Jesus. Uh-uh. No way. Some of you ladies know you got that problem. You better take it to God. You better get delivered from it. It's not just your personality. It's a spirit. I mean, God, God's a pretty practical God. You know, He pretty much says in Proverbs that the man, will, you know, He'll move out. Better for Him to live in the desert somewhere than living in a house with a brawling woman. It's like a continual dripping, drip, 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 drip. drip. And all you husbands need to love your wives. I need to love my wife more. I constantly pray, God, let me be a better husband, a better pastor, and a better father. Yeah. And the only way it's going to work is if you're praying. Well, hey, well, I'm, I'm praying, but my husband's not a believer. Well, you know what? You've got to pray twice as much. You know why? Because you've got to pray for yourself and you've got to pray for him too. Because if you don't pray for him, he can't pray. You don't understand that. If you don't pray, if you don't intercede, oh, see, I'm getting off the subject. I'm just let the God just have His way here. You remember when Abraham stood before God? God said, "I'm going to go and judge Sodom and Gomorrah." Abraham stood before God, face to face. Remember, God said to David, "Seek my face." And David said, Thy face, O Lord, will I seek. I'm not just going to seek your back part. I'm going to seek your face. Which means I've got to get between you and what you're going to go to judge. So if you have an unbelieving spouse, you've got to stand in, in, in front of God face to face. Because He's going after them to judge Him. 
And they can't pray if you don't pray. If Abraham doesn't intercede for Sodom and Gomorrah, they can't pray. We don't pray for this city. The city can't pray. We've got to stand in intercession face to face. So if you're a Maritime unbeliever, you've got to pray twice as hard. I pray this is helping. I'm not trying to be mean. Notice. And because, Adam, because thou hast hearkened another voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. We're talking about the effects of the fall here. You've got a cursed earth, right? In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Right? You've got sickness and disease and suffering and war and strife. This domineering spirit between men and women is supposed to be used to bring the world into subjection to God. That's why we have a warring spirit. Not to war with each other, but to war against the devil. You ever wondered why man wants to go and fight all the time? Because God put him at the spirit of dominion in him. He was to have dominion over this planet. I'm going to conquer this planet. It's just proof. It's corrupted. Praise the Lord. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. Why? Because she was the mother of all living. Not just physically, but spiritually. If you're going to be truly alive, the only, way, the only reason why you're going to be truly alive is because she's going to become the mother of all living. It's going to be the seed of the woman that's going to save us. We fell in Adam, but we were recovered in the woman. Hallelujah! You know what? I'm going to be honest with y'all. I've been up against something here. I really don't know what it is. I don't know if it's me. Are you? I'm not going to blame you or anything like that. But I've been up against something tonight and I feel it in the Holy Ghost. And God knows what it is. Okay? He knows what it is. So let's ask God to move. Lord Jesus, we ask you right now. I love you, Lord, tonight. I praise you, Lord, tonight. Now, we take dominion, God, over every spirit that's not of you, Father, in this house. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. In the name of Jesus, in the name. But I have got, I've got to finish this. I've got to finish this because I started there and I'm going around full circle. Notice. Verse 22, The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever in a state of sin. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he put... Now listen, you've got to hear this very carefully. He drove out the man. He placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim or cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. You know what that is? If we had time, I could go into the next chapter. God said, bring a sacrifice to me. Abel brought a sacrifice of blood. A specific sacrifice to a specific place at a specific time. And Cain brought the fruit of the grounds, a bloodless sacrifice. Where did they take it? God set up His throne in the east inside of the garden. Are you here? The Bible said... 
And what is there? Cherubim are there. And a flaming sword. That's the Shekinah glory of God. So right here in the garden, I see God offering. Listen, He's not trying to shut man out. He's saying, if you will bring the proper sacrifice, go to the next chapter and look at it. If you'll bring the proper sacrifice, I'll let you back in. He's not trying to keep man out. He's trying to make a way for man to come back. This is a work of grace you see in this verse. So look, 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 all the way. What Isaiah saw in chapter 6, the cherubim. Where am I? Right there. And the Lord of glory, high and lifted up. And His train filled the temple. What Isaiah saw in chapter 6. What Moses saw when God showed him his back parts. He saw the throng. Here in the book of Genesis, right there in the east of the garden. We have God Himself in glory. It's your kind of glory, like a sword. Setting between the cherubim. Just like that. And it becomes a throne of mercy. And if they'll bring the proper sacrifice, they'll be accepted back in. So all the way at the beginning... We see God's provision to bring you back into rest, into His kingdom, and to save you, and to deliver you, if only you were willing. And if only you would bring proper sacrifice. And I close with this. Remember the two men of the New Testament? We have Cain and Abel in the Old Testament. The parallel in the New Testament? There's two men. Two men went up to the temple in the eye of prayer. One went self-righteously. you got to hear me now. I feel I know what the answer is now. I, no, 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 I'm not going to say it. No, God, just check me on that. Listen, we cannot get to a point in our lives where we look down our nose at what somebody else does. Because when you do that, you elevate yourself above that person. I wouldn't do that. Oh, you wouldn't? Put yourself in that position. So watch, watch. So the Pharisee goes up to the temple, the hour of prayer. He prays with himself. I thank thee, O God, that I am not as other men. And at the same time, Abel's in the temple. He won't even lift up his eyes. And he prays, God. Be thou merciful to me, a sinner. He's saying, look at me like you looked at that mercy seat in the garden. Look at me like you looked at the mercy seat in the tabernacle. Look at me like you looked at the ark in the temple. Where the blood was applied and the proper sacrifice. You hear what I'm saying? Cain is the guy that's saying, I'm so good. I'm glad I'm not like him. I'm better than they are. You understand? You know what he's pleading? He's saying, Lord, be merciful to me. Literally, he's saying, because the sacrifice has been made. Not because I'm anything. But because the sacrifice has been made. And if you want to stand right now, I want to tell you the good news. That wherever you are, whoever you are, if you will just believe God. Not because you're worthy. And not because you're good enough. Look at me, please. I spoke some heavy truths to y'all a while ago. Was it too truthful for some of y'all? Was it too truthful? Did I hit y'all too hard? See, what we need to understand is the sacrifice, they're saying, I deserve to be punished. That's why Cain wouldn't bring a sacrifice because he didn't feel like he deserved judgment. He didn't believe he was worthy to be judged. If you're there tonight, you need help. You need help. You need to stand before God and say, God, I need a sacrifice. That sacrifice declares I deserve to die. But that same blood that's become polluted by the laying on of the hands is the same blood that becomes the cleansing. 
And if you believe any otherwise, if you think you're better, you're not. You need a Savior. And you need to stand before Him today. And not look down your nose on somebody. Just say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Based on sacrifice. Cleanse me. Forgive me. And the Lord asked the question, which of the two went to his house justified? The one that justified himself or the one that God justified by grace? You know what the key is? When you sin, when you mess up, repent, get it under the blood and keep going. That's the key. Because any otherwise, you become a self-righteous Pharisee. You become a king in your own ideas. You think you deserve goodness because you are so holy. Let's pray. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Father, in your mighty name, Jesus, you have drawn men and women into this house. As Paul said, it's not enticing words with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the power and the Holy Ghost. And there are men and there are women in this house tonight that are in great need. Of understanding. Of revelation. We stand before you tonight. Knowing that every one of us. I know tonight that I deserve death. I know tonight I deserve pain. I know tonight that the only thing that can save me is that sacrifice of yourself on that cross. That precious blood that flowed for me. And on the basis and on the merit of that blood, I ask you to cleanse me. I ask you to forgive me. That is the only way into the Holy of Holies. It's the only way to become the Holy of Holies. I thank you tonight. I pray, Father, for that person that has come here. You drew them tonight, Lord. They didn't just decide to come. They were drawn by the Holy Ghost to a specific time, to a specific place, to a specific sacrifice. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are that sacrifice. That you died on the cross and you crushed the head of the devil and destroyed sin. I lift my head and cry, Holy God. I lift my hands and cry, Holy God. If you'd like to come right now, God, want, God wants you to come. He's given an invitation. He wants a relationship with you. I'm opening these altars right now. That's very unusual for a Wednesday night service. I'm opening these altars right now for you to come. Whosoever will, let them come. No man can come to the Father of the Spirit except the Spirit draw him. Don't come if you don't feel drawn. But if you feel drawn, come. Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yes, God. Yes, God.